we are called to be a sanctuary for those who have been harmed. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Before I read our second scripture this morning, I want to give a little bit of a pre-warning. The passage today deals with difficult themes, including abuse of power and violence against women. So as we engage this text, let us do so with sensitivity and awareness, remembering that there's real and profound impacts that these themes may have on some of us. So if you find this reading distressing, I invite you to take care of yourselves in whatever way you need to. Let us hold this space with compassion and respect for all who hear these words. A reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house when he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to go get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have come, just come from a journey. Why do you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths And the Lord, my Lord Joab, and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. 
Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David intended him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. In the evening, he went out to lie on the couch with his servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So in the morning, David wrote a, lab, a letter to Joab and sent it by hand to Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so he may be struck down and die. David's journey from humble servant boy to a powerful and privileged king is both remar remarkable and sobering. He began as the youngest son of Jesse, taking she sheep in the fields with, sm with a seemingly small and weak body. His victory over Goliath marked the beginning of his rise to prominence, showcasing the strength that lay within that small frame. From that moment, David's path to power saw him anointed as the king, celebrated as a warrior, and ultimately established as a ruler with vast authority and power. Yet as we reflect on David's path, we must consider how his journey from, from vulnerability to power brought new challenges. So today we explore a moment when a misuse of power had a profound and devastating consequence. I want to be clear up front. This message will not attempt to redeem this man or put a positive spin on his actions. There are many scholars and pastors who are already happy to do that work. Uh, and I have sat through a sermon or two in that vein. There is a discomfort in reckoning with how a man after God's own heart did such unspeakable things. Ordained by God to be in this leadership position or not, there's no getting around the violence. There's no getting around the depravity of David in this passage. And the truth of the matter is that he should have never been in that place to notice Bathsheba bathing. Spring was the typical time when kings would go to war and the leaders of those nations would go along with them. But David sent his armies to the battlefield without him. Why, you may be wondering. Because he could. He was the king. He called the shots. And his power allowed him to avoid the risk and the horrors of war. So he made the decisions about war far from viewing the impact. He didn't have to risk his life. He didn't have to see the dead bodies of his soldiers. He didn't see, have to see the impact of poor tactical decisions. So while David was treating war like a game of chess, he was in his palace idling. And so to be able to, to notice Bathsheba for the first time was only possible because of where he was positioned. Because his residence towered over the homes of his people. So when Bathsheba was performing a purification ritual, she would have assumed that she had privacy. When so many men were already at war, what was there to worry about? But she was not even safe during a religious ritual in obedience to her God. But when there is a predator full, with full awareness of his power, no one is safe. When a man with at least three other wives and servants at his disposal to fulfill whatever wish he had, depraved or not, that did not even protect other women. When he saw her, she, he saw she was beautiful, 
and he knew that he had the power to compel her. So when he sent his servants to bring her, I wonder how many times that story had already played out. Did that servant know their role well? Did the script readily come to their lips? The king has sent for you, and we both know what that means. And we both know you don't have a choice. So when the predator goes to his bedchambers, he can pretend that she is there willingly if he so desires. And this is the part in the movie when the screen goes blank because our imagination fills in the gaps about what comes next. But to be clear, it is crucial for us to acknowledge this harsh reality. What happened in that room was an act of sexual violence. Bathsheba's pain and trauma are real and significant, and we must honor her by speaking that truth. To not call it rape is negligent. Whether it is fair to use modern day understandings of legality and morality of such an act is understandable. But for someone who hears or reads this story, it may sound like something they have experienced. So it is vitally important that we call it what it is. Rape. To be a community that is safe for everyone, we must courageously face these difficult truths together. We better be able to readily and clearly name the atrocities of one of the central characters of our faith. We better be ready to be clear that once the man was done using Bathsheba, he discarded her. And the only reason that she comes back into the story is because her rape resulted in pregnancy, and that created a big problem for her rapist. And what is terrifying about this account of her relaying the news that she is pregnant, she's not even referred to as by her name, simply the woman. In fact, the rest of the story is so focused on her husband and on her rapist. Soon her husband will become a central part of the story and will soon become the next victim of the depravity of the king. It's interesting how the text de details a lot more about what led to Uriah's demise than to the devastation of Bathsheba. But that's by design, of course, because across the millennia, Children, women, the poor, and, the s and slaves operated as minor characters that or or orbit, uh, orbited around the person in power. So the audience, audience is not so much worried about the minor character. They want to focus on the major character. So the main character's story gets told and retold. Oftentimes, the benefit, to the benefit of rehabbing the person's legacy. In the articles written about many a powerful person after death, it lists often lists so many accomplishments, but oftentimes neglects to list the horrific abuses of power and the devastation that it left in its wake. Who cares about the minor characters? Friends, God is deeply aware and cares about the plight of all of God's children. In a story written in a, within a specific context by a fallible man, the fullness of God, who God is can never be captured. So for this moment, let us center Bathsheba, who is no minor character. O oh Bathsheba, woman made in the Im sacred image of God, you are more than just beautiful. In fact, your beauty does not even come close to describing who you are. Your abuser reduced you to an object, but you are so much more. No words will begin to be able to describe your, 
your ability to survive and persist in spite of the violation to your humanity. Bathsheba, we affirm your strength, honor your pain, celebrate your invaluable contribution to our shared story. You are not remembered just for the trials you faced, but for the indomitable spirit you, that carried you through them. Your life is a testament to the healing power of hope, the affirmation of dignity, and the everlasting impact of resilience. So when we conspire to forget your story, when the world conspires to relegate you to a forgotten character, that we know that you are more than just the worst thing that ever happened to you. You are more than the pawn in a game of power and domination. You are more than the child you bore. You are more than the wife you became. You are more than the title of victim or survivor. You are seen. You are cherished. You are not forgotten. Friends, this monologue is owed to many folks throughout history and living yet today. This monologue is owed to the people who have survived their own abuses of power, many of which are women and children, many who have been harmed by their community, by their community's inability to affirm and support them when they were at their most vulnerable. Many will testify to the deafening silence when they were finally able to whisper their truth. Many whose dehumanization continued in the way that they were not believed, the way that they were dismissed, or what happened to them was minimized. Or the way that we espouse to believe all women, but that comes up short when the alleged perpetrator is someone we know. Then we fall back on needing to hear both sides of the story or to let the courts decide. Forgetting the fact that less than 1% of rapes end with a felony con conviction in the United States. We forget that at least 89% of victims report some level of distress, high levels of physical injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. There's much to be done to rectify some of the harm done to these survivors. So as we reflect on this story, we recognize the profound harm that the misuse of power can cause. This story compels us to confront the harsh realities of power, of the power of abuse and the, and the way that we decenter the voices and experiences of survivors. So in centering these survivors, we affirm their humanity, we affirm their dignity, we affirm their strength, and we acknowledge their pain, and hopefully cre commit to creating spaces where they can he heal and be heard. This church we are called to be a sanctuary for those who have been harmed. And this begins with repentance, which is more than just words, it's a profound and ongoing commitment to change. Repentance starts with acknowledging the harm that was done, recognizing that our actions sometimes cause pain. This means listening to survivors more than just saying I'm sorry. Furthermore, repentance requires us to take concrete steps to make amends. True repentance means committing to changing our behavior that allows this abuse to occur in the first place. So in a spirit of repentance and transformation, let us pray together for strength and guidance as we undertake this work. Gracious God, we come before you in a spirit of repentance. We ask for, our forgi for forgiveness and guidance as we seek to make amends. 
We dedicate ourselves to the work of justice and healing. So may our church be a sanctuary, a place of safety, a place of healing for all who enter. Empower us by your spirit to create a community where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In your holy name we pray. Amen.